And uh, in studio with uh, Pastor Randy Coyle, R.C., good morning to you, my brother. Good morning, my beloved. How are you? Awesome possum. How about yourself? Doing well. Yeah, he wins God in the park this year. That is going to be normal time, Memorial Day weekend, Friday, Saturday, and then we'll do a Sunday service, uh, weekend of Pentecost. Mm-hmm. And then Passover, we're going to be in the square this year for Easter. It's branching out, huh? Well, remember, we used to do God's in the square years ago before the pandemic. Yeah. And uh, we've resurrected it. Ah, I like your put on words there. <laughs> resurrected it on Resurrection Day. Yeah. So good time. Right. So yes. God's in the square. Is that a contraction of God is in the? Yes. Okay. Yes. Not multiple. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's funny you say that, John, because we had a group came in from South Africa about eight years ago for God's in the Park, and it was a huge apostolic church in South Africa. They sent like a dozen people from there to Martinsburg because they had a vision that Martinsburg was going to be one of the places that God was going to break out when he came with revival. I never heard that story. Before. How amazing is that? Yeah. They, they actually contacted us from South Africa. I don't think I could spell South Africa at the time. Uh-huh. And we started, uh, I think it was um, one of those Skypes or whatever it was back then. And um, we met them. And they said they had this vision about Martinsburg. And there was two other places in the United States that they wanted to go. But when they came and they saw the banners that said God's in the park, it scared them at first because (laughs) they thought it was multiple gods. I said, no, 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 no. It's God is in the park. They were ready to leave. They were ready to go back to South Africa and probably have me lynched. But it worked out okay. So thank you for clarifying. Yeah, that's all right. I would have never thought to ask that. What's funny because I just did a teaching on Rabbi Jonathan Kahn's book, Return of the Gods, and lots of people are kind of confused with that because it capitalizes gods instead of making it small but for the book cover purposes. Mm-hmm. So it, it kind of gets confusing for people. We had to explain that at first as well. So uh, spend Passover and Easter Sunday with us at God One Ministries International Building the Kingdom Resurrection Day Celebration, April 9 from 2 to 5 o'clock. Free lunch, worship, praise, skits, uh, clothing closet at the town square, in uh, Martinsburg, of course. And if you're new to the uh, area, that'll be 100 East King Street is where everything is going to take place. Skits, tell me about the uh, improv there. Well, it's it's going to be a great day. One of the things that we felt was this. We have to be, as God's church, mobile. That's one of the missions of God One, is that we be mobile and flexible to be wherever people need us to be. And we thought, what a great time, Easter, to go to the streets and really not just accommodate people and and bring an Easter service, but also bless people that need to be blessed. So we're going to be serving great food, and we're going to be giving away clothes, and we're going to be really ministering to people's needs on every level, whether they're being addictions or or any other kind of stronghold. And then we're going to be some great worship music and some great people that are really talented in the area of music are going to be coming in and helping us. Uh, we have a national group, the DeLauder family. They've been all over the world. They're going to come in and help us to really bless the people of Martinsburg. And then, of course, our worship team, Pastor Ed and Margaret Dance, they'll be there and, and our whole team. But we're going to do um, music and, and some of the stage stuff that we normally do at God's in the Park for the first part of the day. And then about 3.30, we're going to do really a reenactment of the um, tomb scene from the Resurrection Day. Mm-hmm. And then we'll be talking to people from that point and then also giving people an opportunity to um, – just plug into the ministry and coming together as a community. A survey I heard uh, within the last year talked about uh, the belief in God among the younger population in the country and how those numbers are so much lower than they were a couple generations ago. Uh, And any kind of an attachment to religion has been, uh, those numbers have been declining over the years as well, Randy, do you see that reflected as you think back to your youth growing up in the, in Berkeley County and where you are now running the ministries? Do you see that in West Virginia and Berkeley County specifically, too, as a trend? Yes. Do I see it as large of a trend as I have other places in the country? Probably not, because our values really in the state of West Virginia, in this area in particular, are still closer to what they were when we were younger, but not at the place that they were. So like as far as Gen Z and Gen X, I think one of the problems that we've encountered was really explained to me the best by a young man that falls in that age range. 
And he said this. I was at a meeting with him at Panera Bread. He wanted to be a part of God One Ministries. And this was years ago, and he was starting out as a new pastor, and he was really just full of fire and, and vigor and passion, and it was tremendously encouraging to be in his presence. And he was saying to me that he felt one of the biggest problems with his generation in how they perceived Christ and how they walked in their relationship with him was because of what was really done in the past as far as his relationship in the church. And I said, well, explain to me what you mean by that. And he said, well, for, for generations now, he said, what's happened in the church is we've taken the youth and put them off in programs and kind of set them aside from the gray hairs of the church. And we've done that to kind of get them out of our way. And in some ways, it's alienated them. So then when they go to college or they get a chance to make their own choices, they go their way, and it's a separate way from where they grew up. So I think that we've made some mistakes in the past, and we have to be the generation now that rectifies those and really comes in relationship with Gen Z and Gen X. Do you put any uh, truth into some of the concerns people have that for the last 40, 50 years, pop culture has told us that feels good, do it, nothing's wrong, answer to yourself if you're happy, it can't be bad for you. There's no such thing as a bad choice. Well, it's funny you say that because lots of people are talking about a movie called The Jesus Revolution. And if you think back, that was a movie that depicts some of the things that were transpiring about 60 years ago. And we've seen a tremendous deterioration of our culture in the past 60 years. And one of the, the key things, when we start tracking it and looking at it specifically, we as a ministry feel that one of the worst things that happened during the Jesus Revolution is we were evangelical, we were evangelistic in going out and leading people to Christ and leading people into a relationship with Him and into the church. But in doing that, when God's Spirit touched earth and all of a sudden you saw all these people, hippies and, and everybody else being saved, and you saw this great awakening all across the country, we did a phenomenal work in leading them to that place, but then the problem is we allowed the world to disciple them. So what happened is while we were leading them into the church, which is what the Great Commission talks about in Mark 16, when you go to Matthew 28, it talks about from Jesus' voice that what we are to do then after we lead them to Christ is we are to disciple the nations. So one of the things I think that we really missed over the past 60 years is we allowed the devil to disciple the people instead of the church and for the church to really move into all the mountains of influence we feel the church should be a part of of every one of the mountains they should be a part of government they should be a part of the family education media arts and entertainment business every mountain of influence is a place that we should be willing to go to to minister to disciple to bring people to christ john gilstrap I'm looking at the the name of God One Ministries International again. Not to keep going back to grammar, but it's one W O N, yes. not O N E. Yep. When I first heard it, I thought it was O N E. So, what is the? And is this? Are you part of a? Is this your ministry, or is this part of a larger? It says international. So, is this a, a denomination unto itself? Well, we obviously have a headship. So, you know, we are ordained and licensed by people that are above us. Um, God One Ministries was started by myself and some other pastors, and it was started really when I came out of prison. There were people that were praying for me while I was in prison. And God won. God won. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. In other words, my life was broken, my life was destroyed, and others with it. And then when God came in, the victory was there. So he won in my life. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to really go and minister to people that were in the same places of brokenness as myself or, or other places that are similar and help them to win as well. Now, I was growing up, <clears throat> I'm Catholic, and I, I, I believe Rob is too. Indeed. <clears throat> and so correct me if I'm wrong, but when, when I was growing up, there was Catholic and everybody else. You know, that was kind of the, the, the nature of things. And then as I got older, then, you you know, the Catholics and the Protestants. Protestants were Baptists and Methodists and, you know, all, all the biggies. It seems to me that over the course of the last, 
I don't know, 50 years, 40, 50 years, there has been a, a growth of of many more independent independent uh, churches. churches. I'm mm-hmm. not. I'm not sure. Why do you think that is? I mean, how is is it because the people aren't comfortable falling into the Methodist or Baptist or or, or mold, or is it traditional organized religions? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think what's happening is this: when you go to the Book of Acts and you study the Acts of the Apostles and those that were discipled by Christ, you don't see them broken down into denominations. I think denominations were a man-made thing, and actually, we have almost 5,000 denominations in the United States of America. I mean, that's almost hard for me to even conceive. Mm -hmm. So really, I think what you've seen, John, is you've seen ministries that are coming up that just want to follow the works of God. They want to follow Jesus, like the Acts of the Apostles. If you look at the one book that's still being written, it's the Acts of the Apostles, and that book is being written, and I think what you're going to see and what you are seeing is ministries that are coming up and saying, we don't want to align with men, we want to align with Jesus. So you're going to see that continue, and I think it's going to get bigger. And really, we should all come into the unity of the faith. God doesn't have separate rooms when we get to heaven. In other words, they're not a room. And they, when you come in, they say, oh, wait a minute now, put him in the Catholic room. and Oh, he's a Baptist, now put him in the Baptist room. We're going to be together in heaven, so we are going to have to learn how to get along on earth at some point. They're following the works of Jesus, but those works and those words are relayed to them by a man. Yes. So, uh, and that man is you in this particular case and the person that we're talking to, right? And and you are not perfect. Absolutely not. You are not without fault. A work in progress. Right? A work in progress. In fact, it's it's funny you mention that because when you say ministries are led by men. Or women. Or women. Yeah, yeah Exactly. The thing that I think we have to be cautious of is when a man gets too much power. And uh, I'll explain it this way. Rob, you and I used to go out, and you would help us do openings of the different gyms that I would open. And when you came into that business, you would notice that it was a dictatorship. I mean, you, you felt You ran that. everything. Uh, people were in fear of me. People were bowing down to me. People were in a place where they were going to serve me on every level to make sure that they came out okay at the end of the day as far as their employment. That was not of God. That was of man. And that was a man that unfortunately had gone to that level of pride and arrogancy that he needed to be broken. But here's the situation, Rob. When you give a man the kind of power that some people have, like for instance, you know, when I was on stages in bodybuilding and there were thousands of people chanting my name, very few men can handle that anywhere, whether they're in religion or whether they're in business or whether they're in arts entertainment. That's something that power and fame and, and all that that goes together can destroy from within. And I think the one thing that we have to really change and, and be cautious of, especially with some of the things we've seen happen over the past matter of decades in the mountain of religion, in the church, is giving the power to a man that is not Jesus Christ. Now, certainly God used us, and certainly when he left the Mount of Olivet, he lifted up his hands and blessed them and, and gave power to men. But it was his power, and it's always his power, and we are to walk in his image, not in the image of men. And I think that when we start to get to a place where any religion or any denomination elevates a man to where a man is worshiped and a man makes decisions without covering and without accountability, we're in trouble. So while you have many different ministries, each of those ministries should come together as one. And each of those ministries have to have, like I told you in the beginning, John, we have covering and we have headship and we have people that that are over us as well. And that's very important. There's a cliche that there's, there are no atheists in foxholes. Right when when you're when you're when you're at the bottom and you're absolutely terrified, saying up a prayer is is feels like the thing to do. Yes. So I guess my question to you and in you did have a Rob shared with me your background and, and you had mentioned that you had been to prison and, and such. Was that your foxhole? Was that did you have to reach bottom? Do you think before you saw the light, for lack of a better expression? I did, John. And and I'll tell you, the funny thing is. I really wanted that. I didn't know it, 
And I certainly wouldn't have chosen the way it happened. But before the point of derailment came, it was a matter of weeks before that. I share this sometimes in my testimonies I used to do years ago. I haven't done a, a lot of those for, for many years just because they're, they're older testimonies, but they're always relevant. I remember it was weeks before I was taken down, before the federal government came in and shut me down and ended my reign. I got out of my car. I was driving from my home in Brunswick, Georgia, to my office in Waycross, Georgia. <laughs> now, you as a writer can appreciate that. <laughs> you know, I was as far from the cross as you could be. Uh -huh. My office was in Waycross, Georgia. At some point, you think, I would get it. But I wasn't getting it, John, and I had many warnings. And I remember getting out of my car that day, and it was very, very seldom that I even drove. I usually had a driver, and I was by myself that day. And, and I just got out of the car, and I looked up at the sky, and I said, Lord, I don't know if you even know me, or I, I don't know about any of this anymore, but, but I need out of this life. And, and I can't do it. I, I can't do it. And it was weeks later, um, there were sharpshooters on my lawn, and I was done. And so, yes, that was my place. And you said, hey, God, look, I, this isn't exactly what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, candidly, John, it went from bad to worse to worse right. to worse to worse. But every single facet of it, as situations and circumstances and life got worse, God got better. And it started from the very beginning. I was claustrophobic. So when they first brought me in and they closed that door, I mean, you can imagine what that was like. And I didn't know what to do. I closed my eyes and I was just petrified because the walls were closing in. And I said, God, please, 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 I can't do this. I opened my eyes. I've never been claustrophobic since. I've never had a problem with that. I've getting an elevator, get on the top of a building. None of those things bother me. And then it was just a journey that started where he started removing strongholds and, and, and tearing down places that I had built up and that I had really partnered with the devil to be a destroyer. 